Throughout the 20th century, there have been thousands and thousands of marine biologists who have worked tirelessly to advance our understanding of the oceans and the life within it. And without all of this cumulative knowledge from all of these scientists, we would have no idea how ocean ecosystems function, what threats they face, how we can mitigate these threats, and the oceans would be in a much sorrier state than what they currently are in. But there are some specific and important voices of marine biologists throughout the 20th century who have shouted the loudest and been heard the most. And they have shouted about some really amazing messages and have had some profound positive impacts on our natural environment, especially the beautiful blue ocean. These are some of their stories. So I'm going to be covering the lives of four famous marine biologists, why their work was so important and what positive changes they made. So I'm actually going to be doing this video over two parts. So this first part, part one, we'll be covering two marine biologists, Rachel Carson and Eugenie Clark. And then in the second video, I'll be covering the other two marine biologists, Ruth Gates and Ayana Elizabeth Johnson. And I'll be wrapping up and like saying some concluding thoughts in that part too. So keep your eyes peeled for that. So our first famous marine biologist is Rachel Carson, who was actually born all the way at the start of the 20th century in 1902. Now, she's a bit of an atypical example when it comes to marine biologists. She didn't grow up wanting to be a marine biologist. She had never seen the sea as a child. And the way she became a marine biologist was a little bit of a convoluted path. But she was born in Pennsylvania on a farm, like in the middle of the United States, grew up without seeing the sea. And actually, as a child and throughout her later life, her passion and interest lay in English and writing and literature. And she became a published author at the age of 10 when she published her first story in a local magazine. Now her family wasn't particularly financially well off, um, but her mother recognized her talent and really wanted to send her to college to give her opportunities. So they sold off a whole bunch of their family possessions, including their family china, so that she could go to college. And understandably, her major was English because that was like what her passion was. But while she was at college, she discovered the wonderful world of biology. And she actually switched majors, to everybody's surprise, from English to biology and graduated with a biology degree. She said in a letter that even though she loved writing, she felt that she lacked imagination and biology gave her something to write about. Now, after she graduated, she attended a summer school at a marine biology lab in Woods Hole. And this was the first time she had ever seen the ocean and she immediately fell in love she would spend the whole day just combing the beach uncovering all these cool new animals discovering a whole new world she did then go on to do a master's but before she could complete her phd due to financial constraints she had to take a job at the u.s bureau of fisheries and she was actually only the second lady ever to be permanently employed but here you know she did normal science work she analyzed and wrote about fish data and that kind of stuff but more importantly, she put her passion to writing to good use. And she wrote a whole bunch of things for the general public. She wrote radio script broadcasts. She wrote newspaper and magazine articles. And she even published a few books. And she found such great success in her writing that she quit her job as a scientist to become a full-time writer. And she firmly established herself as the poet of the ocean because of her beautiful and poetic prose when writing about the ocean. However, her biggest success only came towards the end of her life. Now, since about the mid 1940s, Rachel had been interested in the use of synthetic pesticides in the agricultural industry. These chemical pesticides had been developed with military funding of science after World War II, and they were being like really punted by the government and by the chemical industry. Um, in the agricultural industry, even though their effects on nature and on people had not been well established. And so Rachel was concerned about this. So throughout the years, she did a whole bunch of research in this topic. She found scientists who were like researching the effects of these pesticides. She interviewed them, she read their work, and she gathered all of this knowledge. And she kind of found two main sort of camps of thought. There were scientists who thought that yes, uh, the, there is something harmful about these pesticides or there were scientists who thought that no, there wasn't anything going on here. But by 1960, Rachel really couldn't ignore the hundreds of examples that she had managed to uncover where pesticides had caused harm either to people 
or to the environment. And she really wanted to use her voice to let people know about these negative effects and what was happening and how, how harmful they were. So she accumulated all of this knowledge and she um, put it together in a book, which is now what she is most well known for. The book was called Silent Spring. It was all about the harmful effects of the overuse of chemical pesticides, particularly DDT. And the book was excellently researched. It was it was a scientific book. It had all these scientific findings. It was peer, re peer reviewed by other scientists. But because of her beautiful poetic writing style, it reached a broad audience, like way beyond just the scientific community. And it became wildly popular after it was published. Now, as with anybody who goes against, you know, these big industrial giants who are making some lots of money off of something that is wrong, uh, Rachel and her publishers faced a lot of criticism and a lot of trouble. You know, these big chemical giants, they threatened lawsuits, they filed complaints, they made their own um, campaign about why you should use pesticides and they even attacked Rachel herself. You know, they questioned her scientific integrity because she was a trained marine biologist and not chemist and they attacked her personally too. Too, and they um, said that she was good looking but unmarried, which meant she must be a communist, which was like a huge thing to call people back in the day. But despite all of this like uh, criticism that she was facing from the chemical industry, Rachel and her publishers knew that her findings were thoroughly researched and they knew the message had to be told. So they went ahead with the publishing and actually this whole smear campaign by the chemical industry like completely backfired and now everybody was talking about chemical pesticides. They were talking about Rachel's book. It became hugely popular. She appeared on television talking about it and people agreed with her. They realized that, okay, what this woman is saying is correct and we need to listen to her. And she even testified in front of uh, President JFK's like scientific advisory committee so she was really making her message heard in the places where it needed to be heard. Unfortunately due to failing health and breast cancer Rachel passed away just two years after Silent Spring was published but her legacy was huge and lived on way beyond that. Her work and this book in particular inspired grassroots environmental activism and it made this whole movement of environmental protection and ecofeminism and all of these incredible things. Her most direct legacy was then the successful campaign to ban DDT from the United States and also her influence resulted in the making of the US Environmental Protection Agency which is huge. So because of her dedication, bravery, scientific thinking, and poetic writing skills, she ensured there was this whole like environmental protection legacy and we owe that to her. Okay, so our next famous marine biologist is Eugenie Clark, who was born just 20 years after Rachel Carson in 1922. But her path followed a more typical marine biology path. So she grew up in New York and ever since the age of nine, her mom dropped her off at the New York Aquarium every Saturday morning where she'd wander around falling in love with all things ocean. And an idea that really captivated her even from such a young age was what it would be like to swim with all of these amazing animals that she could only observe from the other side of the glass. So she went on to study zoology at both undergraduate and graduate level and throughout her studies did a lot of research at various marine biology institutes. Now after her studies Eugenie went on to do some research on fishes in the Red Sea which was a hugely under-researched uh, area at the time and from these experiences she wrote a popular book called Lady with a Spear and this book was picked up and enjoyed by a wealthy family back in Florida United States and they uh, were so enthralled with her stories they invited her to come speak and they met her and they decided to open up and fund a marine biology lab for Eugenie in Florida. At the time it was called the Cape Hayes Marine Biology Lab but it was later renamed to Moat Marine Laboratories and anybody in marine biology now recognizes that name because she turned this teeny tiny little one room marine lab into a huge world renowned research institute. And it was through her work at this lab that she earned her really cool nickname, the shark lady. She conducted many behavioral experiments on sharks and she really just wanted to show people that they were not the mindless killing machines that everybody thought they were. So she did these behavioral experiments where she trained them to like respond to visual cues and she found that 
sharks could be trained at a rate similar to some mammals which was like groundbreaking knowledge at the time and she used this information to like dispel myths and assumptions about how sharks were stupid and just mindless killing machines and couldn't be trained so you know she opened people's eyes to like how intelligent they could be because she loved sharks and she wanted other people to love sharks she was also one of the first ever marine biologists to use scuba diving for research purposes now her diving career started off with a bit of a rocky start where on her first ever dive her diving hose that led to the helmet ruptured in the early 1940s and she was left gasping for air and she nearly fainted before she could make her way back to the surface but she did not let that stop her and before the fear could really set in they fixed the helmet she got straight back in for her second dive and basically from that time on dive throughout her career and it kind of became like a hallmark of her career she would spend days at a time underwater with relay divers studying the behavior of fish and she also looked at the behavior of sharks and she found these sleeping sharks which showed scientists that not all sharks had to continually swim to keep breathing so there was lots of insights that she gained through this sort of um, scuba diving for research approach which she kind of pioneered so not only did she do this groundbreaking research but she really also wanted to get other people in love with the ocean and in particular sharks you know and just like how rachel carson used her writing to reach out to the broader general public Eugenie gave lots of public talks. She was an excellent speaker. People loved her stories. She was on television shows. She even helped create the first ever IMAX film. So she really like put the knowledge out there in the world, made some waves, excuse the pun. And you know, success for her wasn't easy. She was in an incredibly male dominated industry, but she never let that stop her. And my parents would say, well, maybe you can study typing and how to be a good secretary and you can become a secretary to somebody like William Beebe that would be exciting wouldn't it and I said no I don't want to be anybody's secretary I want to do that stuff myself I want to be like William Beebe so her childhood curiosity led to this prolific lifelong career I mean her last dive was at the age of 92 and she published the findings from that dive in scientific literature just weeks before she sadly passed away so she really changed the world's understanding of sharks their behavior their intelligence she blazed trails for women in science and she was just an incredible lady all right so that's the end of part one we've covered two really incredible famous marine biologists rachel carson and eugenie clark who both used their voices to make some really powerful positive change in the world for the ocean so yeah i hope you guys enjoyed learning about them as much as i enjoyed learning about them don't forget we have two equally as amazing women coming up in part two of the series so keep your eyes peeled for that and i'll see you then